morning, church family. What a privilege it is to be back with you to share God's word. I need you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's begin at verse 10. We'll conclude at verse 14. Look at what God's word states. It says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. God's word, amen. Just for a little while, I want to talk to you from this thought. The struggle is real. That's what Paul is saying in verse 12. For we do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood. Some people actually think that this is a game. They think that this is a movie or some type of play. But I want to talk to somebody who's going through struggle day in and day out. And whether no one else is able to see it or not to you, your struggle is real. Last week, we talked about let's get ready to rumble. And in actuality, this is a continuation of that sermon. We began last week by talking about how this was indeed just an introduction to where we were getting ready to go, that this was a real battle. And Paul was saying the only way that you can be successful in this battle is to put on the whole armor of God. Look at how he begins in verse 10. Let me go back and unpack some of the scripture that I left last week for this week. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. There's no other way to find strength. And ironically, it's not until we find ourselves weak that the Bible says we're actually strong. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That's when God's strength is made more perfect. It's in our weakness. And the reason that a whole lot of people are not ready to rumble, the reason that a whole lot of people don't understand that the struggle is real and where it's coming from is because they don't believe that they're in a real battle and they're not acknowledging that they are weak. They think that they can actually fight this battle on their own. They actually think that they can go into their own arsenal of weapons and become victorious in this battle. But he begins this particular passage by saying, we must be strong in the Lord. And in order to be strong in the Lord, we must first acknowledge that we are weak, acknowledge that we cannot win this battle, that this unseen foe that we are engaged in battle with is somebody that's wiser than we are, someone that is stronger than we are. In fact, Isaiah chapter 14, as well as Ezekiel, Chapter 28 tells us exactly who we are dealing with. Remember, I said last week, the way that this is written in its original language is that it's a once and for all thing, that we must put it on and keep it on. But most of us view God's armor as a work uniform or a jersey that athletes put on before games. When work is over, you get into something that is more comfortable. It's the same thing with game jerseys. They are typically worn by athletes during the game. When the game is over, the first thing they do is pull off those jerseys because the battle is over. You take off the work uniform because your day has come to a close. But that's not the same with the battle that we are involved in. This battle is 24-7. And so the writer is saying that to put it on and to keep it on, because you are engaged in spiritual warfare 24 hours a day. Can I talk to somebody that know for sure that you are in a battle, that the struggle is real? Every time you turn around, something is going wrong. Every time you turn around, somebody's getting on your nerves. Somebody's always pushing your buttons. 
Somebody's cutting you off in traffic. Somebody's trying to second guess or undermine you. Somebody's trying to bring up your past. The struggle is real, but are you ready to rumble? That's the question. We are in a real live battle. And once again, we're dealing with an enemy that cannot be seen. Has anybody ever watched the movie Predator? They are fighting an enemy that they cannot see. And that's why it's so difficult to defeat that enemy. But once they studied him and watched how he operated, it was not easy, but it was certainly something that they were eventually able to do. And whenever we get to the point where we are ready to employ God's weapons, that's when we're ready to fight this battle. And he says the reason that we need to put on the full armor and not just some of it is so that we might be able to stand or withstand the schemes, the tactics, or the tricks of the devil. Look at it for yourself. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil. The words stand against actually mean stand firm. It is a military term, which suggests that no matter what the enemy is doing, hold what you got. Stand firm. Stay in place. It doesn't matter how many guns are going off, how many guns have been drawn, how many bombs are coming your way. Paul says that God says to stand firm, to stay where you are, to hold your ground. And that's how you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But when the battle gets heated, most of us want to tuck our tails and run. Most of us want to get out of position. And that's what the devil does. According to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He says to be sober, be vigilant, be alert. Why? Because the devil is roaming about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. But he says to resist the temptation to handle it on your own. Resist the temptation to run. When the lion roars, is so that the animals who are hiding might get out of their hiding place and run and try to seek shelter somewhere else. And it's when they get out of position, they begin to get stuck and eventually pounced on by the lion. And that's what the implication is. Hold what you got. Don't run. There's no need to run because you have on the full armor of God. And so therefore, you are actually able to stand against the schemes, the tactics, and the tricks of the devil. If you watched last week, I remember telling you by way of illustration that whenever I go outside on the patio to get my daily devotion in, it's as if there is a little bird that is waiting for me. It's like he shows up only when I have my Bible in hand and I'm ready to start my daily devotion. It seems like when it begins to get good to me, God is speaking and I'm in worship mode. The little bird begins a concert. It's like he's a one man band. And I mean, he's singing up a storm and it is so distracting. And the reason that I don't kill the bird is because I resist that temptation. The reason that I don't kill the bird is simply because I've got on the whole armor of God. The reason that I don't kill the bird is because I understand that my fight is not against the bird. And we all have to come to that place where we recognize our battle is not against the people that we see. Now, they're at fault because they're being used by the devil to get to us. And I'm telling you, whenever you seek to do something for God, the enemy will use someone or something to try to distract you. But listen, Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, to resist the devil. That's what we got to do. That's what James says in chapter 4, verse 7 in the book that bears his name. He says to submit unto God, resist the devil, and then he's going to flee. A whole lot of us are not able to ascertain what 
is ours in that verse simply because we're trying to just resist him all by ourselves. But it says to submit ourselves first unto God, and then we'll be able to resist him. But notice what he says, stand firm. Don't go anywhere. A whole lot of us get ready to take our gifts and leave the place that we have been situated. A whole lot of us are ready to bail as soon as the battle begins to get too hot. And so we're ready to walk off of a job, walk out of a relationship. Why? Because the battle is too hot for us. But understand, when it's too hot for you, it's the right temperature for God. And a whole lot of us miss out on God's glory. A whole lot of us miss out on God moving miraculous. We miss out on God displaying his unbridled power all because when the battle begins to get heated, instead of being ready to rumble, instead of recognizing that the struggle is real, instead of understanding that our fight is not against flesh and blood, we pack up and we leave and God does not have an opportunity to show us that when the battle is at its hottest, that's when he's able to show up and cause us to understand all over again that the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. But a whole lot of us never get a chance to see that because we're so quick to give up. We're so quick to leave our church. We're so quick to walk away and never ever allow God to be God. And so look at what it says in this next verse. It says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against powers and rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places, against spiritual hosts. That's who we're fighting against in heavenly places, ranking demons, fallen angels. And listen, the devil can only do what God allows him to do. But don't think for one minute just because that is the case that we're fighting an enemy that is weak, an enemy that we can go hand-to-hand -hand combat with. Because if you believe that, you're sadly mistaken. He's an angel, but he's fallen. But that doesn't mean that we can tangle or go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him on our own. And so look at what it says in that next verse. Therefore, as a result of everything that he said from verse 10, to verse 12, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand or withstand the evil day. Remember, I talked about that last week. That's when everything goes wrong all at the same time. I know that I have a few witnesses, somebody who could testify to that. It seems like the bottom has fallen out and anything that could go wrong, all goes wrong at the same time. And it's in that day that if we're not careful, we will be tempted to just throw up our hands in defeat and act as though God is no longer on the throne. But that's when he says, you've got to stand. That's when you've got to hold your grip. That's when you've got to stand firm because help is on the way. And so look at what he says. Having done all to stand, don't move. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. What is that? That is a picture of a Roman soldier's belt. In that particular time, everyone wore long, loose fitting garments, robes, if you will, even the soldiers. And so it was loose fitting clothing. And whenever someone was in a hurry, they would take that loosely fitting clothing and tuck it in their belt so that they can walk faster. And so Paul is saying, because the battle has already been set in the ring, if you're truly ready to rumble, when you truly understand that the struggle is real, one of the first things that you have to do when your armor has been placed upon you is to gird yourself with truth. Take that loose fitting clothing and tuck it in your belt. The belt holds everything together. And I can't understand for the life of me why folk don't want to wear a belt. I've seen fellas holding on to their clothing when all they have to do is put on a belt. If a fight breaks out, 
They cannot run the way that they need to. They cannot protect themselves. As soon as they put up their dukes, their pants will drop. Paul says when you're really ready for the battle, when you're really prepared for the battle, he says the first thing that you have to do once you put on the whole armor is to take anything that is going to be a hindrance to you and to tuck it in your belt of truth. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, no active soldier entangles him or herself with the affairs of this world simply because they want to please the one who enlisted them as a soldier. In the verse above, Paul says to endure hardness as a good soldier. He says we're not to get intertwined or tangled up in what's going on that causes us to get distracted from what we've been called to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the unknown writer says to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us so that we can look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. We get so entangled in stuff that does not bring glory to God. We allow people to get on our nerves and keep us up at night. Why? Because we have not remained focused. Why? Because we're accepting lies instead of the truth. Look at what he says. To gird ourselves with truth. Is that what your Bible says? Come on, I'm back now. In Ephesians chapter 6, look at what he says. He says in verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the belt of truth. One of the things we recognize early on as truth is that we are in a real battle. Remember, the second thing we have to recognize as truth is that our foe is not of this world. The third thing we have to recognize as truth is that the weapons that we are using are not of this world. And he says, when you're ready to engage, when you're ready to rumble, when you understand that the struggle is real, you have to put on your belt so that you're not encumbered with all of these things that prevent us from fighting in a real live wrestling match. So he says to gird your waist with truth. We just left 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let me go back and quote another passage of scripture in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy which is verse 15, it says to be diligent. King James Version says to study, but that word study doesn't mean like you're trying to study for a test. It means be diligent. It means to do all that you can do to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. That word truth comes back full circle yet again. The Gospel of John is replete with that word truth. In fact, in John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman near a well. And he informs her that if anyone desires to truly worship God because he is spirit, they must also worship him in spirit and in truth. Also in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus also says that the spirit of truth will lead you and guide you into all truth. In John chapter 18, beginning at verse 36, concluding at verse 39, Jesus is engaged in a conversation with Pontius Pilate. He tells him that his kingdom is not of this world. In fact, He's come from heaven to bear witness of the truth. His father is the truth. He goes on to tell Pilate that all who hear him and truly hear him will know that he's speaking the truth. And then Pilate has the nerve to say, what is truth? He did not even understand that all that is true, all that truth is composed of was standing next to him. Jesus is true. His word is truth. And unless you have an understanding of the truth of God's word, you're not ready to fight. If you believe that you're not supposed to be sick, then you do not have an understanding of the truth of God's word. If you believe 
that you can lose your salvation. You don't have truth or knowledge or clear truth or clear knowledge of God's word. You're not ready to rumble. You don't understand that the struggle is real. It begins with an accurate interpretation of what God's word really says. And until you're ready to understand it and apply it, you're not ready to rumble. Church family, it has been a pleasure to spend this time with you. May God bless you. May God keep you is my prayer. I have one final announcement to share with you. Next month, September 27th, I will be celebrating my second year pastor's anniversary. And I need you to go to our brand new website. And that is St. Luke mbcg.org to find out who's preaching and to look at so many other things that are taking place at the St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church of Galveston, Texas. Church family, I love you. May God continue to bless you and keep you is my prayer. We thank God that we dodged the hurricane, but in us dodging the hurricane, it also means that someone else is experiencing the effects of it. And so let us continue to pray for areas of Louisiana and several other regions that were affected by the hurricane. Stay fruitful, stay faithful is my prayer. Amen.